my name is Dennis Kogel. I'm a reporter for uh, German media. I do stuff on the radio. Uh, I'm actually right now recording stuff for Deutschland Radio for a feature on games that will air sometimes next week. And write about indie games for a blog called Super Level. Um, and on stage with me is somebody you probably know a lot better than me, and that's Jonathan Blow. Uh, hi, Jonathan. Hi. <laughs> this is weird because you're standing and I'm sitting. What? It, it's a bit weird. Yeah. I, I'll sit I'll down. I'll stand and you can oh, sit. I, all right. We can, we can we switch around. We can switch around. So Jonathan has been making games since the mid-90s or even before that. And uh, probably most of you know him from his game Braid, which came out in 2008, was a 2D platformer. Uh, with an interesting kind of time-bending mechanic, time-rewind mechanic that went further than what people knew from, for example, the Prince of, uh, Prince of Persia titles. And right now he's working on The Witness, his second game, and that's super exciting. So, and yes. Not really my second game. Well, well, it, you're, yeah, I mean. <laughs> second game second since, I mean. The, the next game since Braid. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's something about Braid where I did that game very differently than anything that I'd done previously. And so I kind of reset who I am as a developer at that time. So second game of that <laughs> new lifestyle or something. Nice. So that's kind of year what? Uh, 2008. So it's year six onto Braid. On, on The Witness, you mean? Or after Braid? After Braid. Braid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So h how do you feel right now? Like about kind of... You need to get more specific. Well, <laughs> like I have after a lot of feelings about a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> after kind of... Uh, like what's your, what's your general kind of, kind of feeling right now as a, as a developer? Like are you, are you in a good place? Kind of... Yeah, I am. I mean, I'm cool. doing I'm doing stuff that's very interesting mm -hmm. all the time. Um, the The style that I have of game development is very research oriented, which means that after a project, I tend to be a more knowledgeable developer than I was at the beginning of the project, and that's that's very good for personal satisfaction. Mm. You know, it, and it's because I work on things. Like for me to be really interested in it, I have to not fully understand it at the beginning, which means that I will understand it better, you know, at the end. Um, so that's that's good. Uh, at the same time, if you say as a developer, like I, this whole uh, there's this whole thing out there about like what people think a game developer is now, or especially an indie game developer or something, and I'm, I'm not really in any of that. Like, I'm not in the indie community. I'm not in the AAA community. I have friends from both of those, but it's like, um, you know, I spend time with those people and not like in any of those scenes because I don't know why. It's but never it's never been in my personality, yeah. you know. But you have experience kind of on both sides. You worked yeah. in AAA development as well, so somewhat. Yeah. 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 So what we wanted to talk about today was mostly puzzle design because this is something that I find really exciting about your games that uh, you take your time to design really intricate interesting puzzles that kind of manage to uh, to do new things, to be interesting to challenge people a lot and to still kind of manage to to also convey different themes with that convey kind of different different messages with that so kind of i wanted to 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 ask you what are you kind of could you could you talk a bit about what you're doing puzzle wise in the witness sure actually before we mm -hmm. say that i i want to point something out like the you know Braid was whoa <laughs> for back? a moment there so Braid was very specifically a puzzle game, right? And The Witness is very specifically a puzzle game. And so I've learned, you know, uh, th those games help teach me a certain kind of design. And we'll, we'll get more specific maybe about what that is in a second. Um, but, you know, once in a while I've gone to conferences and given speeches about it. And, like, here's how, uh, you know, we apply this philosophy to come up with a design for a game. And people always seem to think that because my specific examples are about puzzles. These ideas only apply to puzzles, and that's that's not true. In fact, I have a side project that I've worked on a little bit um, where I've applied 
this these kinds of ideas, and it's not a puzzle game, mm -hmm. and they translate very well. So, um, you know, don't think if we're bringing up a puzzle as an example that that that's a limiting factor or something, right? Um, anyway, so in in Braid, let's start there. Um, some of the things that I learned in designing that game were, um, f first of all, you know, I learned very slowly over the course of revising these puzzles, like what makes a puzzle good, in my opinion, and what makes a puzzle bad? Like, like what makes a puzzle really powerful and, and what makes one um, just ugly and confusing, right? And it has nothing to do with difficulty, right? Or it's orthogonal to difficulty. So, um, like, if you, if you sit down and you want to make a puzzle game, anyone in the world can make a puzzle game Mm, that was a nice cut. <laughs> arbitrarily hard, um, if they want to, right? Right. Like you can you can make a puzzle take eight hundred and sixty steps, half of which somebody has to guess, and it's impossible. Right. Yeah, I guess the most famous example for that is the whole um, the whole broken sword. Or no, was it was it Gabriel Knight and the cat and the cat yeah. uh, beard uh, mustache thing? A very famous example. Yes. Yeah. Um, so so anyone can. Anyone can pile up an arbitrary series of steps that the player has to do, right? And that's, that's not interesting, and it's not really what makes things good to play, right? So I was doing this investigation in Braid of like, what is that that makes it good to play? And when a puzzle, and again, this can be generalized beyond puzzles to like any kind of game interactivity, right? But when it really knows what it's about, when it knows what the point of it is, and then, you know, Braid's a level-based game, so when designing one of those levels, you clear out anything that doesn't help focus on the point, right? And in fact, I didn't do this. There's, Braid's a pretty minimal game, but like there's a, there's probably a couple monsters in the game that maybe shouldn't be there or something because they didn't do anything, mm -hmm. right? So, but I did 95% of what I'm saying, which is you, you go and you clear out everything that doesn't focus on that specific idea um, and then it, that extends to every part of the game. So not just like what we think of as level design, but visual design, right? Like where, where does your eye go when you look at the screen and you're trying to solve this thing? You want your eye to go to the relevant details, right? Because anyone can like visually obfuscate something to try and fool you, but that's not a very deep puzzle, right? It's like, oh, haha, I, I, I tricked you because you looked in the wrong place. If that's the point, very specifically, and you make a good point out of that, that can be good. And in fact, you can make a whole game out of that. So like uh, Space Giraffe or like Tuning by, by Cactus um, are visual obfuscation games. But you don't, if that's not really what you're doing, you don't want to rely on that. So, so this idea of focus and deliberacy, and, and when, you, when you are very deliberate like that, and somebody understands the puzzle, the resonance is very strong. It's like you hit a bell, right? Um, so, um, and that's why, that's one of the main reasons why Braid is received as a good game, even though most people don't really understand that. Um, and, and, you know, in the course of doing that, some of the puzzles were very difficult, some of them were very easy, actually. And there's not, you know, a lot of games have this idea that you have to ramp the difficulty up. That's the classic idea that I think comes from arcade games, where the goal of the arcade game was to, like, kick people off after a couple minutes. So, of course, you're ramping up. But um, there's no real reason for that, actually. And what I find, you know, in a story, if you're, if you're writing a long story, you don't generally do it as ramping, ramping, ramping action, and then the earth explodes at the end, right? You have pacing, right? You have highs and lows and highs and, and lows. And so the difficulty in Braid was like that too, right? So anyway, taking that into the new game. Um, well, or maybe let's backtrack a bit for, for Braid. Yeah. Um, because in I recently replayed Braid for a bit and realized that lots of puzzles at first seem kind of, uh, you don't explain them, but you seem to explain them if you look for the right clues. Like um, uh, there's a puzzle room where you have to jump on, on the heads of these little monsters you have uh, to reach kind of to, you have to jump on all of the heads to unlock the next puzzle piece. But if you start jumping on their heads just, just like that, just li like, like you would 
like go from one monster to the next, you notice you can get up to the locked door. So what you have to do is kind of uh, look at the optimal path you have to take, and that that's not even that doesn't even have to do anything with the time rewind thing. That is kind of the the main. Uh, a part of the game, I would say. It does, actually. Oh, does it? Yes. Oh, if nice. If it didn't have to do with <laughs> rewind, it wouldn't be in the game. So the reason mm. that puzzles me, <laughs> right, there's certain puzzles in Braid that are designed to catch you if you're trying to sleepwalk your way through the game and not think about what you're doing. This is not the meanest one, but it's one of them. If I'm think So there's th this level you're talking about comes back twice, or mm -hmm. it, it comes back in a different form later. But, but the first one, the thing that's mean about it is you know, there's a, there's a gap that's too wide to jump across, and you need to bounce off a monster, and the monster you need to bounce off is actually below the gap. So you like bounce down and off him and, and really high, right? So um, the problem is that if you're sleepwalking through the level, you killed that monster like a minute ago, and you probably don't even remember where it was, right? So the, the way that you even figure out any po like like what you end up with is this barren level with a couple more monsters and then just a gap that's obviously way too wide to get across and you're like how do I there's nothing here right and so then you have to engage rewind and maybe go back to when there were things there and figure out which of these things was relevant right um, yeah so that's that's why it's sort of a rewind True. puzzle yeah. um, but it's kind of in, like I, I find it very interesting because I, I kind of I kind of remembered how I played it first and then started to kind of oh yeah I I have to do that here and then uh, in that in that moment I have to rewind you rewind water all over <laughs> that's okay should I do you have the rewind button rewind button <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. um, so it kind of I don't know it um, in this puzzle this puzzle kind of caught me off guard because I completely forgot it existed it existed and I and I had to kind of start thinking about the wait what was there and kind of very consciously engaged engage with the puzzle mechanics with the mechanics of the game with the physics of jumping and 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 everything and um, I just noticed that there's a lot of that in in the game I mean it was like that it was like that forever I guess and I I, I, I I'm just thinking like how did you kind of consciously I can cooperate that to kind of build upon all these little kind of things that they are they're all important so I'm trying to uh, you know there's a lot of thoughts about this that I've yeah. had for a long time mm -hmm. and I'm trying to go back to then and mm -hmm. think about what like how it started but I'm not exactly succeeding, so let me just <laughs> jump to what I think now, um, which is just that most games, you know, games, um, they're hard to develop, right? And they take a really, a great deal of effort. And um, the weird thing about that is that we are generally not very efficient about the thing that we're making. So, so let me start with a AAA example, and then I'll, I'll come back, right? So, so you have some AAA shooter game, you know, like Call of Duty or something, right? Mm -hmm. Single-player campaign, and the vast majority of the budget of that game is modeling and texturing of all these unique locations as you make your way through the campaign in whatever city you're, you're going through or whatever, right? And all that stuff, like a, a modeler spent probably weeks on this building that you run through in five minutes and you don't even really look at, right? Um, this is gonna tie back to the witness in a really good way, so that's, <laughs> that's <Great>. good. <laughs> um, and so at, at some point it occurred to me that that happens with design as well, mm -hmm. right? It was, it was part of that trying to get to cleanliness and minimalism, like games are not very good at using the design elements that they have like you can usually get a lot more juice out of the very few things that are in a in a game. And if you start adding more things and you haven't really done everything with what you already have, it loses focus and it, it becomes it becomes a mess. So I'm not really the first person to to think of that, right? There once was a game studio called Looking Glass who made games like Thief and the original uh well, I don't know. A number of games. Um and they had this idea that 
you know, you wanted emergent situations in your game. And what emergence is, is when rules of the game interact to generate a response that is unexpected and, and not even necessarily explicitly designed. So they would do all this programming and design to try and support emergence, right? And what Braid is, is not really the, like emergence is a dynamic property and Braid is like the static version of that kind of same idea where it's like, let's look at all the elements that are at play and let's really make sure we are using all of them. Um, and again, that's not really a new idea in puzzle game creation either. It's just that even when people think they're doing it, they appear to not mm. be that successful often. Yeah. yeah. I uh, once talked to um, to Santa Regione, the Italian developers who made, um, who made Mirror Moon. And they are also board game developers, actually. And kind of they told me about their journey making the game Attack from the Aliens in Outer Space, which is kind of a neat little survival horror game uh, that you play with, with people where some people are terrible aliens that want to eat the survivors and the survivors want to escape. Um, and they kind of told me about how they needed even to incorporate the kind of the package design, like even like every piece of the, the product basically, or like product, like the, the game, and was influenced by by another like like you you couldn't separate one like one piece from the other because like even the number of cards was related to how many cards fit in the box and uh, the, even the number of pencils they packaged in was also kind of related to to what they're trying to do so yeah yeah it's like that kind of an idea mm. really um, I don't care so much about packaging. I mean, mm -hmm. I try to make packaging reasonable, <laughs> but for me, the important part is the, the actual right. intact unit of the mm. game. Anyway, I said that would tie back to the witness. So, yes, you did. <laughs> so what, what that has to do with the witness is, um, so in relation to Braid, you know, Braid has about 70 puzzles in it, which is a very countable, discrete number. And in the witness, it's a much higher number. It's like 600. Uh, it'll be more than that by the time we're done. <laughs> um, and a lot of them, though, are really small and, and simple, mm -hmm. right? Like some of them you seriously can do in five seconds. And in most puzzle games, you would think, oh, well, a puzzle that you do in five seconds is not very interesting, right? But because each puzzle has a very specific point, and because there's so many of them, we can sort of build these streams of thought where there's point, 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 point. And because some of them, or many of the puzzles are easy, you actually get a flow of ideas that you can't achieve when they're harder. So in Braid, there's, there's um, some kind of sequencing of ideas because you go into a specific world and each world in Braid has a theme and the, the puzzles are all around that theme. But because many of the puzzles are hard, and you know some of the puzzles in Braid you might sit there for an hour or two and not be able to solve. And there's only 12 total on that theme. You couldn't ever consider it like a flow, right? But in The Witness, it's more like reading a book, but it's a nonverbal book, which is, if you, it's an interesting feeling that I don't think a game has ever done. And uh, I, well, I'm not sure. Some people notice it, mm. right? And, and some people maybe, I don't know if they'll notice it or, okay. or what they'll think about it, but it's, I think it's really interesting because what happens is you go into this flow of ideas and then at some point, um, because it's all nonverbal, you've built up an actually a rather sophisticated idea about like what this piece of puzzle language means because you've been figuring it out to solve these puzzles, right? So you have a very sophisticated idea about what this piece of puzzle language, this clue means, but you don't have words for it, right? Because it wasn't given to you with words. So then if you go ask someone while they're playing, oh, what are you trying to do here? They'll be like, uh, um, and then they'll start talking and after about three minutes, they'll finally be able to put together an explanation in words that's like a paragraph long of what they're trying to do. And um, that, you know, to talk about things like what, what are games in the future or what is the potential of games, like the ability to craft an extremely complex idea without language is very interesting and not something that very many people have tried in history and certainly not with the kind of interactive bandwidth that we have today, right? So then the, um, because this communication is very important in the game, 
Um, that has to extend to every aspect of the game. So when we talked about environment design, right, in contrast to something like a shooter where you run down the hallway and you never see it again, right, um, in this game, the idea is to build a world where every location uh, withstands being visited many times, and each time you go back, you may see more things about it that matter, and that that were in front of your face the whole time, they weren't obfuscated. You just didn't really know that they mattered, right? Um, and that, uh, that again helps in the same way that I was saying with Braid, that the more minimal that you make the, the level and the more, um, the, more, the more clear the result is as when you solve something or when you come to an understanding, that a, a modified version of that is at play here in a much less minimal environment because a 3D first person environment can get pretty complex. Mm. So we talked about uh, about the witness a bit. So let, let's maybe just show a quick kind of trailer for people who don't know what the witness is. Can you maybe say a couple of words before that? So it's a first person. Oh, we have a password here. Oh, we do can, have a password. Is it that. is it Lorenzo? It's, I don't it's probably know. it's probably Lorenzo. We can. Just, just tell us our pass, your your password, Lorenzo. <laughs> anyway, well, yeah, well, then then we have time to talk a bit about the witness. So the witness is a first-person kind of puzzle exploration game set on an island. Yeah. And the puzzle mechanic of that is, from what I've gathered, lines that you draw on kind of these weird electronical kind of objects that are placed in the kind of little screens? Yeah, they're sort of like mm -hmm. iPads placed right. around the world <laughs> or something like that. Cool. Yeah, hello, hello. <laughs> I don't, I don't, yeah, all right. <laughs> so, I, would, I wish we could play the visual. Is that is that something we're trying to do imminently or? Well, it would be easier if I could show it and talk over it, but. yeah. Well, uh, Lorenzo went away, so oh well. that's okay. on him. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, th these things are embedded around the environment. And what, um, so this was an attempt, again, to get around the kind of problem um, of the cat hair mustache, right? Yeah. Like, because I, especially toward the beginning of this game, um, I pictured it as an adventure game. And the classic problem with adventure games is that <laughs> okay, you know, if you play like a, a racing game, right, your minute, what's called the minute of gameplay uh, is, you know, hey, I'm steering, I'm like dodging stuff and I'm trying to take this corner really carefully and there's a flow to that, right? If you're playing a fighting game, you know, there's like timed button hitting that you're doing in complex sequences and uh, there's a flow to that, right? Yeah. So, so most, if there's a shooter, your flow is like, you know, toggling between like dodging and targeting and stuff, right? So there's most modern game design genres that we consider to be good have this kind of flow where they know what they're about and the player can sink into. Now adventure games, I will claim, even though I grew up loving them, when I look at them now as an entire genre as a designer are kind of terrible because they don't have that. They don't have any kind of idea what they're about, right? What an adventure game about is about is there's a fiction and then we kind of one-offed a lot of puzzles that implementation-wise don't even have that much to do with each other, and they're all like if statements, essentially. Like, if you use this object on this object, then this unlocks. And that is not, um, first of all, because those things aren't related to each other, really, they can't make a minute of gameplay. Um, but also, it tends to, um, because all of these things are just, just one-off uh, special cases, right? Everything in an adventure game is a special case. What that means is that designers have to be tremendously disciplined in order to make everything actually make sense to the player, right? And usually that stuff doesn't make sense. Um, actually, there's, <laughs> there's an analogy in movies, right? Like, you'll watch some terrible Hollywood movie and like a character will do something that then leads to something else happening, that then leads to something else happening that that character wanted to happen, but that character never could have planned to make those things happen. Like they, it only makes sense if you think about it backwards, like, oh, this happened because of that and this happened because of that and therefore, right? 
Um, that same thing happens in adventure games all the time. It's like, oh, if you do this and that and that, then of course this will happen that's good for you. And it's like, but how am I supposed to ever think of doing those steps, right? And so the idea was to come up with a system. Um, are we actually on the screen too? Well, we, we are. Well, no. Well, there, there are no sites. Oh, yes, okay. Well, and you have the little mouse so pointer. So we'll just sort of show this. Um, so the idea was to build a world where it's um, always kind of obvious where there are puzzles. You know, so first of all, we we try to make a location that's very beautiful, um, that's limited in scope. So, um, you know, basically the far end of that island, like as far as you can see, is about as far as there is, and then the island ends. You can watch. F oh, we have audio skipping. It's very <laughs> sad. Um, you can range freely across it, right? And you'll find things like these panels. And what these panels are, are very, very clear indicators. Like, look, there's a thing here to solve. And how you solve it is you draw a line on it. That's what you learn. This is actually part of the tutorial area, and that's what you learn there, is how to interact with the things. But once you've learned how to interact with them, there's an open question anywhere else in the game, which is like, okay, what, what is sort of the password on this panel that will open it or solve the puzzle, right? And um, sometimes they have to do with symbols on the panels that are here, and sometimes they have other clues that are spread around the world. And so um, what this does is it, it gets rid of the bad part of adventure games, and it makes it into less than an adventure game and more of a puzzle game, actually, right? So the bad part of adventure games is all the fumbling about, like, where am I? What am I even supposed to be doing? Is this thing that I'm stuck on even a puzzle that I can do right now?